Welcome once again. We are um, starting chapter two today, a very famous, famous scene um, that is referred to in pop culture a lot, hence the reason I put this <laughs> comic strip up here where the guy is at the wedding and he says, hey Jesus, that was amazing how you turned the water into wine over there. Could you change these sticks into a set of bath towels? I forgot to bring a wedding gift. Oh, it just cracks me up. So um, there's, there's one of uh, two guys standing at a water cooler and Jesus walking away and it's wine and they're like, like saying cheers to him. Anyway, you can find all kinds of pop culture references for Jesus' first miracle. Um, so Chapter, in chapter one, I just wanted to give obviously a quick overview and if any of you have anything you wanna add, please please do. So obviously the prologue are the first, is the first 18 verses and that teaches us um, the way that a lot of people compare it to the synoptic gospels is it's, it's almost the cosmic, um, the cosmic view and the Trinitarian view of Jesus. So, um, we see that he was, he was there at creation in the beginning. Uh, we also read about the testimony of John the Baptist and, and we studied about um, his, his role really as the one to prepare the way. His declaration of the Lamb of God, that Jesus is the Lamb of God and, and why that was significant. And then um, last week we talked about the calling of the first disciples and how, um, what John shows us is that this comes at a point in time where John the Baptist is reflecting on um, the baptism of Jesus. And then we know from the other gospels that Jesus immediately went into the wilderness for 40 days. So this is after he's returned from the wilderness that he strikes up a conversation with, well, actually John the Baptist says, there's the guy you wanna follow. And um, Jesus says, come, come and see where I'm staying. Come and see, follow me. And what happens is he, he Andrew's there. Um, he gives Peter his name, um, Philip, Nathaniel. So these are really what, what we believe is um, an establishment of that first relationship before he approaches them when they're fishing and they drop their nets. Um, so that's, it's just interesting to see that they, they wanted to go where he was. They wanted to be in his presence um, because John the Baptist has, had basically done his job right. And we also in the first chapter start to get a real understanding of the identity of Jesus. But he's the word, he is the light of the world. He is the lamb of God the son of man, um, any others that you wanna, wanna point out, um, the Messiah, he's called the Messiah, he's called the King of Israel. Um, there's a really big list of, of identities of Christ and that's a really good practice to just go through the chapter and just write down all of the things that John, um, that John writes about Jesus. So in that first chapter, they, um, the people who are reading this, this gospel are getting an idea of Jesus, the identity of Jesus, okay? So I'm gonna pray and then we will read chapter two verses one through 12. So let's pray. God, you are so good to give us this day. It truly is a gift. God, we thank you also for the gift of this time together, a chance to read about this, um, this scene, this um, event, this miracle. And um, God, I just pray that we will be able to learn more about your son and how um, this scripture gives us so much to um, gives us so much to consider and to um, remember and to build our faith on. 
We pray with gratitude in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and read chapter two, verses one. Whoa, I can't get that off of here. Wait, verses one through 12. And um, invite you all to read along. And I did, you'll see here in the yellow, there is a um, kind of a, I put that, that verse four, I had it stand out from, from the rest of the, um, the passage so that you would know it's a different translation, different version of the translation, okay? okay. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus's mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. Another translation of this is woman, what concern is that to you and to me? And I wanna just point out right now that this was not, I mean, sometimes people read this with the wrong inflection, okay? Like woman, why do you involve me? It's not, Jesus would not talk to his mother like that. So it's actually a sign of respect that he addresses his mother that way. So I just want to make sure to say that. So he says, why do you involve me or why does that concern me? Okay, basically, why are you telling me that? And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and the disciples and there they stayed for a few days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So who are the characters in our story today? Well, we obviously have Jesus and Mary, his mother. The disciples are there. Um, we have servants, okay? And um, those were the servants of the household that was hosting this, this, um, this wedding. There's also the chief steward who is the host. Um, and we see that there are servants who had drawn the water. So that makes, that pinpoints that, that not all the servants were involved in drawing the water, that there were maybe just a few that decided to take on that task. There's a bridegroom, the guests, and um, the brothers of Jesus are mentioned here too. So what's happening is a wedding. Um, they've been invited to the wedding, which indicates that this was a family that was close to Jesus and his mother and brothers. Um, they took water. And then I said, I said apart the kind of the, the things that were said um, in quotes here, they have no wine. What concern is that to you and me? Or why do you ask? Why do you tell me this? Um, Jesus saying, my hour has not yet come. And Mary saying, do whatever he tells you. And then what Jesus says is fill the jars with water. Now I also, as you can see here, put anything with water in blue and anything with wine in red, just to kind of help it, help it stand out. So we also have six stone water jars holding 20 or 30 gallons each. That's a lot. That's a lot of water, right? 
Um, we know that they filled them and John makes sure to put in the detail that they filled them to the, up to the brim. Um, water was also drawn out and taken to the chief steward and that was the water that had turned into wine. We also know the steward did not know where the wine came from, but who knew? The servants knew. It, that's a, a point that John also makes. There's a discussion about good wine and inferior wine and the fact that the good wine has been kept. So basically this is high quality, high quality wine that, that um, they're drinking. And then a few other details at the end that we learn is this is the first of Christ's signs or miracles. It reveals his glory. The disciples also believe in him, right? And then it tells us that they went down to Capernaum and remained there. This chapter starts with the phrase on the third day. So this is three days after the calling of those first disciples. So that tells us that, that they have been with Jesus for several days now, okay? Um, a few other ones to point out is that um, the steward talks about inferior wine that's usually brought out after the guests are, have already been drinking, right? Um, that's a timing thing that's referred to. And um, we also know the where is Cana and then Capernaum is also mentioned. And we're gonna look at a map to see how far away they are. Um, and then a why that's mentioned is the, the describing the stone jars. They are stone jars that are used for the Jewish rites of purification. Um, that's basically cleansing before eating, cleaning, cleaning their hands before eating. And then I put the how, I put it in parentheses. We know how this happened, how the water was turned into wine was a, a miracle of Jesus, okay? Any questions, good? All right, so the location of Cana. Um, John starts again the chapter on the third day and that, so it's three days after the d disciples, he calls those first disciples, but um, it, we, we'll see on the map that um, to, to walk from Bethsaida to Cana, where Cana is, is, is pretty far. So it may have taken that long to get there, which is a, um, again, the, on the third day is just a way to, um, to let us know that this is how much time has passed since the, the passage before. Um, the exact location of Cana is actually uncertain. There are, there's a modern day site known as Kefir Kenna, and it's four miles northeast of Nazareth on the road to Tiberias. Um, a lot of people just have kind of called, they, they've kind of pinpointed that and said that is actually the location of this because it's right off that main road. But um, there are actually a lot of scholars that say, no, it's actually a town called Kirbet Kana. It's on a hill about eight to nine miles north of Nazareth. So the reason why is because of archeologists, right? Archeologists, um, have been the ones that have given us clues to these kinds of things before. And they found, um, they found uh, the remains of, of things that would match up with this time period. Um, there was also a Dominican friar who traveled around the Middle, the Middle East in the 13th century. His name was Burchard of Mount, Mount Sion. And he wrote a book about about the Holy Land. He wrote about all the things that he discovered and saw. And um, one of the things is that he said that he believes Kirbet Kana is Cana, that this, this town that's a little further from Nazareth is actually where this occurred. Something else to note is that in either way, either if it's Kefir Kenna or Kirbet Kana, they're both rural towns. They're not cities, 
right? They're not Caper it's not Capernaum, it's not Nazareth, it's not Bethlehem, it's not Jerusalem. So that is significant because, because why? Jesus decides to, well, actually, we, we find out Jesus actually doesn't make the decision to do it. But Jesus' first miracle is not in Jerusalem. It's in a small rural town, right? The Messiah's birth was where? Not in Jerusalem, but in a small rural town, right? So it's, I just think that that tells us a lot about him, about his humility. And come on, Zig, lay down. Sorry, Ziggy's staring at me. <laughs> Um, I, I just love that it happens kind of out, out in the, at a family gathering, right? That his first miracles at a family gathering kind of out in a rural town. So this will give you a little bit better idea. And if you can't see the map, if you can move, um, up in your right hand corner, you can move your kind of the, the little window of me, if you need to, you can move it around. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm on the main, the bigger map here, and you can see the Sea of Galilee. Bethsaida is up on the north east side, right? Capernaum, we can, in, in, the, in the blown up um, picture, you can see a little bit better. Capernaum was up on the, uh, still on the north, but on the other edge, on the other side. And then, Nazareth is um, pretty far away. And these were so small that I, I tried to find a map that kind of blew them up a little bit. So you can see that Kafir Kana is the one that's four miles northeast, that Kirvet Kana is actually further from Nazareth, but closer to Bethsaida, okay? Um, Either way, you can see they had to travel quite a while, or quite a while, quite a distance in, in three days to get to the wedding. So Kirbet Kana is the one that most people believe is Cana. But if you look it up on maps, a lot of people put it closer to Nazareth. Okay. I'm gonna move these over a little bit, hold on. Okay, any questions? I personally love like looking at the maps and kind of, you know, figuring this stuff out, so. They would have, anyway, they, if, they were, if, if they were traveling, people would travel, there was a road where Kafir Kana is that went straight to Tiberias. So that's why a lot of people believe it was there, but Kirbet Kana was a little bit further out in the wilderness. And then I want to point out at the end of this, it says that um, they went down to Capernaum from Cana. But Capernaum is north of Cana, as we can see there, here, here, isn't it? Capernaum is north. And John says they went down. But I found this in, a, in, in this book. It says, um, we in the modern world are oriented to looking at maps with the north being up and the south being down. So if we're in Florida, we say we're going up to New York. If we're in Washington, we say we're going down to California. But the ancients of Bible times did not have maps the way we do. So when they said they went down from Cana to Capernaum, they actually meant they went down. They went down in altitude. They descended. Because Cana was in the hillside, uh, Capernaum is on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, so it's, you know, lower altitude. And they went up to Jerusalem from Capernaum. John meant they went up approximately a thousand feet. So I just thought that was interesting, an interesting point for us to, to realize, not just the distance, but the different, different um, what, what's that word called? Topograph topography, is that the word? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so they did go down to Capernaum. They went down in altitude. So wine, um, I was telling a few people, I got a 
surprise gift today from a friend. She sent me some wine and I kind of laughed. <laughs> Here I am getting ready to teach on, on John 2, 1 through 12 and I'm putting wine in my kitchen. Um, so wine is a symbol of joy and God's blessing. Um, in the ancient Near East, uh, there was water that was scarce. So wine was actually a necessity rather than a luxury. It came to symbolize sustenance and life. Um, it also was representative of the covenant blessings that, that God promised to his people. We're gonna read about that um, in a few of these verses here. But I think for us, even today, wine is a symbol of celebration, of festivity, of joy. Um, but for them, it really was abundant blessing. Um, it, it just was, uh, something that, um, that the people appreciated in a different, in a different way, right? They didn't, um, they didn't take advantage of the fact that they had this wine, um, at the wedding. So would anyone like to read Isaiah 25, verse 6 for us? This is actually a part of a, like a song of praise. I'm working on it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> 25. 25 what? Six. Yep. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, a rich food filled with marrow, a well-aged wine strained clear. Okay, so Isaiah, that's a prophecy, but it's also, it's almost a promise, right? It's a promise that God is going to do these things um, for, for his people. And it's a, it's a provision, right? It's not just he's going to provide a feast. He's going to provide a feast with, um, with rich food, with aged wine, with the best meat, right? The best of the best. And then Psalm 104, verses 14 and 15. I'll read that. Okay. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate bringing forth food from the earth wine that gladdens the heart of man oil to make his face shine and bread that sustains his heart okay this is another it's a psalm of praise and um obviously wine gladdens the heart of man says the psalmist that that has to do with, um, with the blessing and the joy that, um, that goes along with wine. So when Mary says they have no wine, many people interpret that as her saying, they have no blessing from God. Um, practically though, at the wedding, like they've run out. Um, and so there could be a, a double meaning here, but, um, but many say that drinking wine from the jars that were used for purification would have sent a message of spiritual purification too. So maybe, maybe Mary saw that there was something else happening here at this wedding. Um, it, it just depends on how you want to interpret it. I think, um, I think it could be both. I could, I think obviously it's pretty practical that she sees, okay, the party is still going, right? And they're getting low. But she might have been saying something to Jesus that indicated something more. He says, what does, what, what concern, oh, I think I wrote this out wrong. Um, why does this concern me? Okay. And again, he says, mother, this is, he calls her mother. It's a sign of respect. He wanted to emphasize too, I think that there was a different relationship with her now. Um, 
some I've I've actually heard um, a sermon that mentioned that you know this indicates that he's no longer Mary's boy. This is the time when he's going to move to really move to being the Messiah. This first miracle. What do you all think about that? Do you do you see any significance there? Is it his way of saying, mom, cut the apron string? <laughs> he was 30 years old. You would have thought he would have cut it a little sooner. Yeah, true. <laughs> Good point, Bev. <laughs> but he doesn't call her mother. He says woman. Um, so he may have started saying that long before. But it is a sign of respect. Um, he doesn't dismiss her. He doesn't dismiss her, but he does say, um, you know, hey, I'm having a good time over here. <laughs> Why are you calling me? Why are you calling me over to talk about the wine, right? Um, well, it's almost like, too, that he wanted to be anonymous. He didn't want to have attention brought to him. At that absolutely. Point. Absolutely. Yep. He she's she's basically presenting him with a problem mm -hmm. yeah and um he and he responds by saying my hour has not yet come my hour has not yet come and this is um this comes up a lot in in the book of john i wanted us to just look at the one example but you all feel free to look look that up um in a, on a concordance, you can go to, you know, biblegateway.com and type in, in parentheses, my hour, my hour is not yet come, or, and you can see all the places in the book of John that that is mentioned. But in, in chapter 13, verse one, this is the night of, um, of his arrest. It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave his world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. So it's, and that's when he goes and washes their feet. So he, at that point says, um, John writes here that Jesus knew. Jesus knew, okay, it's time. Something else I read here was that John the evangelist pays tribute to Jesus as the son of God in the prologue. John the Baptist commends him as the lamb of God in chapter one. And now Mary, the mother of Jesus says to him, get to work, um, you know, nudges him in a way that says, get to work. Um, and it goes right from that entire chapter where John lays out, this is who Jesus is right to the miracle, which I love. And the role of Christ's mother was to oversee the miracle. The role of Jesus was to perform it and the disciples were to bear witness to it. That's another way to look at this story too. Martin Luther says that this was actually an act of faith, that Jesus questions a little bit her, her request. He debates it even, he questions it, but she moves forward in faith knowing that he will provide, that he will do what he needs to do. Um, so we honor, a, a way we can apply that is we honor God as being good and gracious, even if he acts and speaks otherwise, and all our understanding is a feeling to be otherwise. Um, what Mary shows here is that she is certain that, that God will be gracious, that um, even when there are times when we we uh, kind of say to God, hey, you know, did you notice that there's this problem <laughs> here in my life, <laughs> right? That um, we may get pushback from God, but when we move forward in faith, often he will, um, he will respond. And then another thing to point out is that Mary isn't mentioned, right? That her, she's not quoted a lot in scripture. So it's really important that we do pay attention to this. Um, when she finds out that she is going to bear uh, the Messiah, what does she do? She immediately glorifies, glorifies God, right? Um, and Mary also, I think something she, so weddings at the time, she was obviously, for her to notice that the wine was running out and for her to care that the wine was running out, 
um, in those times, weddings, um, weddings were, you know, seven day thing. They were seven day event. And for them to run out of wine would have been a really big social faux pas. So it must have been a close relative for her to care about it and for her to notice it. And she could have maybe kind of taken it into her own hands and gone to the host and said, hey, um, excuse me, but I noticed that you guys still have two more days um, left for the celebration and you're, you're running out. But she turns to her son. She turns to him and, and um, helps him observe. Well, she basically tells him the problem, <laughs> so. Now the stone jars. Um, this is the best picture I could find that kind of gives you an idea of the size of these things. Um, I think a lot of times when we read through the story, we, we miss that detail that they held 20 to 30 gallons. And these aren't beautifully, you know, sculpted little jars, right? Um, these are big, huge pieces of stone. They've basically been chipped away at to make, um, to make uh, something that's big enough to hold that much water. These, um, the Law of Moses says that stone would not become impure, but pottery could easily become impure. Um, I think that has to do with what they absorb right? Pottery is more absorbent, wouldn't you say? Um, so stone was, stone was the way to go. And uh, these were purification, they used these for purification rituals. They um, were common in Judea and Galilee. And um, we're going to read Mark 7, 1 through 4, because this tells us a little bit more about those purification rituals. Um, Anyone have it, Mark? Seven, is that you, Susan? Did you raise your hand? Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting it. I'm getting, what'd okay. you say, Mark? Seven, one seven through, four. through four. Yeah. Okay, this is clean and unclean. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. Very appropriate for now times. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> it, is, it is kind of <laughs> The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a, cer um, cer a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other tradition, traditions, such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. All right. So... And it's, it's, it's not just a rinse and flick the water either, by the way. It's, <laughs> it's almost as if that 20 second rule um, was established back then, but it's, it, there really is a ritual to it. Um, the way they, they, way they, they move their hands over. Um, I think I would say it's kind of almost like a, um, a preparation for the meal. So to have, a to have uh, six of these jars um, that hold 20 to 30 gallons, that's 120 to 180 gallons. That's about a thousand bottles of wine. That's a lot of wine. Okay, so again, they're, they're about easily three to four feet tall. Um, very, very heavy. So beyond um, the actual miracle, right? Um, there may also be a connection between drinking wine that, gave, that Jesus gave them at the wedding and the wine at the Last Supper. The wine represented the atonement on the cross, right? When, when, he, in, when he institutes the Last Supper. So it's interesting that his first miracle would be something connected in that way to the wine. So the command was fill the jars, right? Um, if you notice in the, in, the, in the passage, he doesn't say, okay, here's how I want you to do it. Jesus was not a micromanager. <laughs> he simply says, fill the jars. And I also want us to consider 
the work that was involved in doing that, right? I put on here, no hose or spigot. There was, there, there was obviously a well nearby. Well, we don't know how far it was from the house, but there had to be a well, a source of water somewhere. So fetching that water in small, do you think that maybe they ran to the well, filled up, then came back, then poured it in? I mean, this was not something that just happened very quickly. It took a while to go and fetch and, and that much water and um, fill those jars to the brim, to the brim. Something I've actually, um, when I've preached on this passage and I've focused on the obedience of the servants. They, they, um, they didn't do the miracle, but they are obedient and get to be a part of the miracle. I never thought about it before, but like you said, Jesus could have just taken empty pots and filled them full of wine. He could have snapped his but, fingers. But, yeah, but he, he required the work of people mm -hmm. in order for him to do the miracle. It's a joint type of thing. Yep. You know, so when we pray for miracles on our own, you know, we have to think maybe we have to take some of the first steps to get there. Mm -hmm. Now, our God is absolutely capable. Right. And, and, um, and able, but I think what this, the fact that Jesus involved Servants, by the way, servants, the lowliest people status-wise at that wedding, right? They were the lowest people on the totem pole there. He asks them to be a part of it. Well, he tells them to be a part of it, but um, they were obedient. They didn't question. And not only that, again, they filled them to the brim. Do you think maybe after a couple hours of running out to the well, they'd be like, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> it is full enough. No, they filled them to the brim. Um, I, I just love that, that um, illustration of, of who Jesus is and, and how God wants to allow, wants to involve us. So this is, uh, this is his first miracle, and I want us to read about the first miracle of Moses in Exodus 7. Don't forget this whole Jesus-Moses comparison, right? The Old Testament, New Testament, the law, and grace. This is, has already been talked about in the book of John. So 17 through 21. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is what the Lord says. By this, you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink the water. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the wooden buckets and stone jars, even in the wooden buckets. When we think of this miracle, we usually just think of the river, but every drop of water was turned to blood. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and its officials, and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. So Moses' first miracle was turning water into blood. Jesus' first miracle is turning water into wine. Um, what did blood symbolize? in those days? Life. It symbolizes life, but... Sacrifice? Mm, unclean. Oh, okay. Is where I'm going with this. Oh, gotcha. It was, it was a symbol of life, but anything that blood was near, you know, um, 
you were unclean as a woman, you were unclean oh, if you right. were That's right. um, having your time of the month because of the blood involved. Um, yeah. So if blood was there, you were unclean. So that's, and, and it says here, like it, not only was it, 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 it actually smelled bad too. Um, so the blood symbolizes, um, yeah, uncleanliness. And then we look at the opposite in this story and we see wine, which symbolizes joy and blessing, right? Mm -hmm. So I just think that the juxtaposition there is quite interesting. Um, I'm going to skip down to this, this part I found, um, Reverend Greg Robbins says, there are three reasons why Jesus performs miracles, to show compassion and meet the human needs that are, that are needed, you know, meet human needs, to affirm his identity as the son of God, and to provide us with a glimpse of the world to come. Do you all see how that, how that is true in, in this miracle? He's showing compassion. How? Steve. Steve. He's saving. Sorry. He's saving the the family from being embarrassed. Yeah. yeah. Um, they could actually be fined in those days if they didn't have all the provisions that were needed. So this is saving this family from being embarrassed, but also actually saving them financially, perhaps. Um, how does he affirm his true identity? Well, there was witnesses to the miracle. Mm -hmm. you know, the mm -hmm. servants, his w mother, the disciples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I love that it doesn't tell us like how it happened, that it just happened. You know, Jesus doesn't stand there and make a show of it, right? And like flail his arms around and like, ta-da. No, it just happens. <laughs> um, and he also performs miracles to give us a glimpse of the world that is to come. I think, well, I want to know what you all think about that. Do you think it goes back to provision? um joy even the the banquet right the supper the yeah. the um the banquet that awaits us the the great wedding feast that awaits us right. so here are just some questions of course feel free to ask your own or give comments to what you think um there are a couple other details about this passage that we didn't cover today, such as the role of the steward, um, the fact that he says, hey, you, you brought out the good wine before, you know, last, uh, which is funny because he basically said, he basically indicates that this party, this, this party, this wedding party has been going for a few days because people are, um, well, they're more intoxicated. So at the beginning of the banquet, when people are sober, that's when you bring out the best. Right. The best of the best is what he was saying. So um, what do you think about the fact that the servants knew? We did talk about this a little bit, but I think it's important that John points out that the steward did not know, the steward, the most important, you know, the host of the, of the party did not know how, where the wine came from, but the servants knew. Sometimes it's the lowly who knows what's going on, not, not the people in charge. The yep. meek will inherit the earth. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Um, what about your understanding of the sacraments of communion, of the Lord's Supper? That's, that's what I was thinking about with him turning it into wine and being his, his blood and the, that whole. The connection to Moses and his yeah. first miracle. I mean, it's, it's amazing how it all connects, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jesus didn't just pick up wine at the Lord's Supper and say, oh, well, drink this. <laughs> you know, there was some 
there's significance there. There's forethought. Um, this is my blood shed for you. And then what about Mary? What about Mary in this passage? She doesn't, you know, we don't read a lot about, about Mary. Um, we do in the, in the gospels, obviously, um, with her being, you know, the, the miracle or the angel coming to her, the birth and the, when she, um, when Jesus is a boy at the temple. Um, but the focus turns away from her. What do you all think about, about her role here? Well, I think they, what you said about the division, like it's time for him to move on. Like instead of her taking care of the problem, she let her son take care of the problem because he was, you know, putting him in that uh, position of power and something he could do. And she knew in her heart he could do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or she wouldn't have asked him to take, you know, she was, she knew he was, even though he might not have thought he was ready, she knew he was ready. Yeah, I think that's the mother's intuition. Yeah. I really do. I think it shows that even though her son was the son of God mm -hmm. and, um, and even though her son was the son of God, he still was her son mm -hmm. and she knew him and she understood who he was. I mean, even from the moment she, yeah, she's like, how is this going to happen? But then she immediately praises God. She believed she was a woman of belief and faith. Um, she, she absolutely, like you said, she, she knew he could do it. And I, I see her kind of elbowing in a way, <laughs> like they've run out of wine. They're running out of wine. <laughs> I like um, the word that you used a few uh, pages back where you said she nudged him. I think yes. Nudged him. Word. Yes. She nudged him. Yeah. Um, he says, he, he says to her, time has not yet come. And she basically says, but it has, <laughs> right? With a little smile and a wink, maybe. Um, so how does this, how does this, uh, how does this help your understanding of miracles? Do you believe that, do you believe miracles still happen and that Jesus still involves us? Yes. He, Jesus is still at work. He is an active, living Lord. I think so. Um, I mean, I heard a story actually just on Sunday about someone who told me about a, an experience they had um, caring for one of their patients. And they said, it is a miracle. She literally said, it's a miracle that I was on call that, or that I was on staff that night. Mm -hmm. um, we use that word, we use that wording, we use the word miracle um, because there are just some things that cannot be explained mm -hmm. with logic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I had an experience years ago where I walked in with a patient at night and um, he passed while I walked in the room and it was just me but I felt like God put me there for a reason because his family wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt, saw his, felt his spirit. Um, it really was what I thought a miracle because that person, that gentleman needed me and I needed him. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and if I had gone into another patient's room, I would have totally missed that. Mm -hmm. I think we've all been recipients of these wonderful miracles. And I think we've all been those who help with those miracles also. We've been on the giving side and the receiving side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sometimes we don't even know that we're participating in something. Those servants didn't know. They had no idea. They're like, fill the water jars seriously. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, you know, people have washed their hands. We're good. <laughs> and he says, fill them, fill all six of them. And they had no idea, but they got to be a part of the first um, miracle. And I think it's important too, at the end of the story, it says um, the disciples put their faith in him 
after he revealed his glory. The disciples knew they had been they had been told by John the Baptist this was happening, right? They knew there was something special about this rabbi. They saw, I mean, they heard that heaven had been opened. Some of them were there. But John the Baptist said, heaven was opened. This is who I'm telling you. And it's almost, it's almost like they needed this, right? They needed to see the the God side of Jesus, not just the human side of Jesus, in order to um, believe in him. And I think sometimes we almost talk, we do the same sometimes, we talk more about the God side of Jesus instead of the human side of Jesus. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, but they're one and the same. Um, can you imagine Jesus saying, okay, we're gonna, okay, we're leaving. See you guys later. We're gonna, um, we're gonna go down to Capernaum now. And the disciples are like, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, you just performed a mirror. They're, they were probably still in awe that, that whole time. Um, but they, you know, Jesus basically said, let's, let's move on. Um, and I don't know. I think that um, <coughs> just the fact that um, John tells us this story is in the way he tells it is so significant um, because again, it tells us about Mary. It tells us about the servants who the good, this, the um, steward didn't know, but the servants did and that the disciples believe put their faith in him after this. So. Are there, do you all have any other questions? Any, do you look at this passage differently now that you know some of these things? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think for me, when I first studied this and, and realized just how much water that was, it just, <laughs> what I had always pictured was not at all what, what um, John describes here, so. Um, well, that's all I have for today. Thank you all very much. We will uh, be doing the um, Jesus will clear the temple uh, next week. It's okay. Another great story. Um, Jesus is flipping tables and, uh, <laughs> and uh, he does it for a purpose. So his personality is starting to come out. <laughs> Thank you for all your preparation, Ellen. Oh, yeah. yeah. Blessings yeah. to you all. Thank you.